Pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum. Pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum. Italian director Federico Fellini is often regarded in the list of great directors. But how great was he? Well, let's just say what Spielberg and Lucas did for blockbusters with Jaws and Star Wars, Fellini did for future modern art house films with Eight and a Half. It has influenced other filmmakers, inspired them to recreate scenes from his work, and continued to get films recognized for being about the movie industry, as it was Eight and a Half. Such directors have recreated his work, like Woody Allen, Francois Truffaut, Tarantino, Lynch, and last but not least, Charlie Kaufman who first started as a screenplay writer, then moved on to the director's seat with Synecdoche, New York. Now, before I get into my next comparison, I want to make a quick question. What made Eight and a Half so highly regarded? Well, as I said before, it's about what Hollywood loves making the most. Films about the film industry, the inside lifestyle of an actor and director. I mean, I made that very clear in my last three reviews. It pretty much overshadowed the rest of Fellini's work. Even though his current films did very well critically and at the box office, they don't get that same recognition as Eight and a Half has today or even La Dulce Vita, which is another film from Fellini about filmmaking. Although, it's very strange for Fellini to be recognized as this great director, and yet somehow, unless you're a diehard fan of his movies as Scorsese, they don't get as much recognition as the two films I mentioned early. But personally, Eight and a Half recited more on me than La Dulce Vita. It was shorter and easy to follow what was happening, unlike La Dulce Vita, which was three hours, too long, and too symbolic to understand what was happening. Then you add into the mix Charlie Kaufman, whose movies share a similar theme, the characters' self-awareness of the world they're in. They were mostly pawns inside of a subconscious world or a fictitious bubble that broke into reality. It could be John Malkovich, plain John Malkovich, titled by his real-life name, John Malkovich. It could be Jim Carrey being self-aware that he's inside of a dream. It could also be Nicolas Cage playing Charlie Kaufman himself as a screenplay writer. Even Eight and a Half has self-aware references. It's named after the number of movies Fellini made thus far in his career, responding to the pressure he felt for the hype he had as a great director, as we will get to see in his movie. He could be considered as the Christopher Nolan of back then. It was expected to deliver astonishing visuals and still be commercially successful. When Synecdoche first came out, some noticed a few similarities to Fellini's film, some calling it a ripoff. But interestingly, according to an interview, Kaufman never saw Fellini's Eight and a Half. So whether he knew or not or went out there blinded, there is no doubt that Fellini's work has a deep imprint in Hollywood and cinema. So let me begin by asking, eight and a half, Synecdoche, New York. What did they have in common? They explore three similar ideas in their own unique way. The first one is our gain and loss for a passion. These are disgruntled directors that face personal struggles. They are womanizers, their marriages get torn apart, which affects their passion project. In eight and a half, Guido is making a film about the atomic bomb. In Synecdoche, New York, Kating is making a play about the meaning of death. In moments like these about a director making a personal piece can also be a reflection of what they're going through. Guido's personal life is as chaotic as an atomic bomb. Kating's play is literally a copy of what he has gone through in his life, whether as reflecting or answering the questions he had in his life. The downside of them is they never get to finish their movie or play for different reasons. One director doesn't care anymore the other one cares too much of raising an impossible high bar. What gets to Guido is not just the pure pressure of having the spotlight every day without having a break or his marriage gone wrong, but he's forced to work on a project he doesn't believe in. He has nothing important to say to such topic as the atomic bomb in the 60s. Now that's a new level of incompetence. For Guido, it's a regular job, like working at an office. He hates it, he repudiates it, because his personal struggles have sucked out any passion he once had as a director. It also sucks out his need to be interactive. He's cold, selfish, and finds no need to be charming with any other, including his bitter matrimony. 
and that's something we see most occasions with unfit directors. We've seen those that fall into pressure that not only hurts their interaction with other actors, but it hurts the project. We've also seen directors that just don't care about the movie and have nothing important to say. Caden, on the other hand, is the opposite of Guido. Aside of being awkward and charmingly unpleasant, he has several love affairs that don't go anywhere, his daughter turns into an exotic model at a young age, he has an identity crisis, he's slowly dying as his illness keep getting worse, and even attempts to commit suicide. But unlike Guido whose troubles made him lose interest in his work, Caden finds inspiration to say something through his pain. He becomes so ambitious with his play that he builds a big set of New York with thousands of extras to mention the second theme in both films, the meaning of death. As I said before, Kaufman's films always share the same similar theme about the character's self-awareness that they are characters of a world that's out of their control. A world made to seem like they have free will, but in actuality, they are puppets. Their lives have been chosen for them by some force of life. They are predestined against their will, not able to escape the life that has been chosen for them. There are a million little strings attached to every choice you make. You can destroy your life every time you choose. And they say there is no fate, but there is. It's what you create. Fellini's films were often known to make the church angry in Italy. Eight and a half could also be the case on how he approaches the afterlife, as well as how Kaufman shares the same views as Fellini. Both films dilute themselves from the traditional heaven and hell to interpret it from an agnostic view. Guido commits suicide, Caden dies from an old age. What both films interpret is that there could actually be an afterlife. The heaven we seek can be the heaven we create in our minds. It is the heaven that every person envisions himself in their own way, whether it's God or Buddha or just a paradise with our loved ones. After Guido kills himself, it then cuts to his personal heaven. The movie he hated working on is cancelled, he not only gets his joy and peace back, but also regains his passion back making movies. Or it could be like Synoctoki in New York, you die and everything falls into an empty shallow of nothing. But it leaves a hopeful message of what dead is about. It's about leaving a legacy behind, so that others can see what we did and might be influenced to become something greater. It can be a movie, a play, or even a YouTube video. Our most personal works are the ones that leave the most impact once we're dead. Whether they give knowledge, educate, or enrich others, it is a hopeful way to say that we did exist. We had the same ideas, agonies, and pleasures as the ones who are still living. Caden put all in his heart to leave a legacy behind because he knew he was dying, while Guido was far gone at this point that he no longer cared about his legacy only embrace death. It's a moment in our life where death sounds too appealing when life has become very difficult. Just like for Guido and just like for Caden. In Synecdoche, there's an actor who plays Caden and studies him. But as he goes too deep inside his personal mind, he ends up committing suicide just like Caden tried early on. What is that saying? Did Caden hate life? Did he actually fall from that building? And was this all just a dream? And that would explain why he never finished his play? Well, that leads me to my third and final theme of both stories. The surreal dream. Something that Kaufman does very well is blur the line between fantasy and reality. That suddenly they become one world. It's hard to notice what is real and what is not in Synecdoche. In Eight and a Half, it's much simpler to tell from reality and dream as it goes from one dream sequence back to the stressful reality and it goes back and forth in that same order. You can tell what a dream is whenever it seems more artistic from a visual standpoint as they both had the same dream whenever the main leads fall under. One where Caden views himself on television, falling as showing the level of stress he's going through. The other is the famous dream sequence where Guido is trapped inside of a traffic with all of his problems as if it were suffocating him. Then he floats out of the car, up to the heavens, where he can find peace. Until reality wakes him up and pulls him back to the real world, where in actuality, he feels like he's drowning in it. For him, he would much rather go back to his nostalgic past as a child, with his parents, his Catholic education, and his encounter with a prostitute. Dream sequences are made to reveal our true character and our biggest desires. 
The deepest desires of Guido were to have complete control over others. As shown in his dream where he's been served by all the women in his past, his past lovers, his co-workers, the prostitute, it's a contrast of how in his dream is under control, while his reality, it's out of control. Now, what I can presume to be Caden's solution can represent how he yearned to be viewed, far from his awkward, timid self, to a more authoritarian person. From a small, ambitious play to a legacy-making art house piece. That is to say, if he did commit suicide. If he did, then that would explain why his own heaven goes fast in time and spends most of his time working for his passion, but with no results and no payoff. Plus, it could also mean he would cover up his pathetic persona to a mysterious alter ego, which in this case could be a female persona that hides and disguises his personal pains. That would also explain why his daughter calls him homosexual, that's why there's a woman at the end resembling him from appearance. Whatever interpretation is, both films can serve as cautionary tales to not be like Guido or Caden in our desperate moment. Instead of taking the easy way out, we should keep pushing for our goals. There is no use of dreaming of our passions, our achievements, or an ambition perfect world if we don't act on it. Depending how polarizing our environment can be, our passions can be shattered away. But what matters is once we're dead, what are we gonna leave behind that can teach and give knowledge to others? Eight and a half is more about the loss of passion, Synecdoche New York is more about what dead is, and it can be very unpleasant to look at for how ugly dead can be. While eight and a half is much more pleasing to the eye with its cinematography and camera movement. So that being said, what is most important about each of them is our legacy. What legacy will you leave behind? You know something? Since last November, I've been kinda stuck with the same themes I've chosen lately with my last videos. How the film industry is evil, how actors become crazy, how they experiment with their sexuality. Hell, I even think I'm becoming crazy for this. Well, from here on out, no more of that. I am done with this topic. So have you seen these films? What do you thought of them? Did you like them? Did you not like them? Do you enjoy Fellini and Kaufman's work? Leave your thoughts in the comment section to see what you thought about them. And if you like this video, leave a like and subscribe for more content. Well guys, tune in next time because I'll be coming back with a new topic as I compare Metropolis and the Hunger Games series. So for now, that's it for today. <gasps> Ciao. Pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum.